Hello everybody. Welcome back. And today we're going to talk about processes. First, we're going to start with a little recap of some of the basic ideas we discussed in the last lecture. So if we see here in this diagram, we can see that Emacs is running on top of this operating system that's providing us an abstraction from all the details of hardware, the CPU and memory and devices. So how do we do this? Well, the operating system is going to provide a set of abstractions. So here I'm showing four of the main abstractions. The process abstraction, which we'll talk about today, threads, which we'll talk about next time, and locks and synchronization, which we'll talk about after that. And finally, some other abstractions like file IO, networking, etc. So as I mentioned, in today's lecture, we're going to start by focusing on the process abstraction to help us build up a model and understand how our operating system works. So what is a process? A process is an instance of a running program. When I run my compiler, GCC, with file A and file B separately, each of these are going to be separate instances, so separate processes. Emacs, when I'm running my editor, is going to be a separate process from GCC. And similarly, if I start up Firefox, to access websites, that's also going to be running under a separate process. Having multiple windows of a single application doesn't necessarily mean that you have multiple processes. Typically, they'll be the same process. In most modern operating systems, we can have many, many processes running at the same time. The process abstraction ensures that for any given instance, all of the data and state of the running program is unique to that instance. So when I'm compiling file A and file B, I don't have any information about file A and B in the same executable instance, right? When GCC is running compiling file A, it only has to worry about the data from file A and it gets to use all the global variables and any other state that you've defined in your program locally to that instance. And when a new instance is run, all of that state will be reset. It makes a much simpler model for you as a programmer. And being able to use multiple processes is a way that we can achieve better utilization of the hardware. We could run them on different processors to achieve better throughput and possibly lower latency to completing a task. So here's a simple example. We can see that there's different ways that multiple processes can overlap in execution. I might be running my compiler GCC and Emacs at the same time. When Emacs is running, it does some processing. And then when it's waiting for me to do some input, I'll be able to run GCC on the same system, right? This is what the operating system will do with techniques called scheduling that we'll see later. It allow us to run these two processes at the, almost at the same time, or at least what we perceive to be at the same time. So this is going to make better use of the hardware because the hardware is always going to be busy. When Emacs has nothing to do because it's waiting for me to do something, we're going to be doing some compilation or taking care of other tasks in the background. The second is that multiple processes could effectively reduce latency. Normally, and if you looked at a really old computer, we'd only run one process at a time. We'd these are called batch processing systems where we'd run process A. And when process A was complete, we would then run process B. So this means that process B, even though it's a very short lived process, would have to wait for A to complete. And as you see in this example, A took 80 seconds and B took 20 seconds, but I'd still have to wait 100 seconds to get the results from my program B. If I'm able to run these two things concurrently to the user's perspective, I'm going to be able to complete B in a shorter period of time. The process abstraction is really key to a lot of the things that the operating system provides, right? In this example, we can see that A still took more than 80 seconds. We didn't cheat the system. We only had one processor to execute one task at a time but we were able to make the perception to the user that each task executes with lower latency. The next important thing is that processes can be used to achieve parallelism. So if you think back to the computers you have, you have many cores on your computer. 
you have a laptop with anywhere from four to eight cores these days, and each of those cores could be running a different task. So we can place different processes onto different cores to execute in parallel. And this is gonna allow us to achieve higher performance, right? So in the example, if we're running four processes at the same time across these four cores, we're gonna be able to complete these four processes simultaneously and then run another set of processes. So let's look at how a process views the world. Each process has a view of the machine as if it owns the entire machine. It has its own view of the address space or memory where all your code data exists. It also has a view of all the open files that are independent of all other processes. It has its own view of the processor. It thinks that it's running on the real hardware even though the operating system might take that hardware away and give it to another process at any given time. All of the state in memory is unique to each process. So when we load data from disk to open a file and start manipulating that file to do some computation, that's gonna change the memory that we have in this running process, and it'll be unique to that process. So when you use pointers in C and you look at the pointers at two, inside of two different processes, the value at those pointers are going to be unique. This is great because this simplifies the programmer model, right? We don't have to think about what other processes need or want or what other processes data might have in memory. It also provides us the basic abstraction of protection that we're not going to damage another process's data whether it's because it's another user or because it's another instance of the same process. Sometimes we might wanna be able to interact between multiple processes. And there's multiple ways we can do that. The simplest is that we, we can use files to communicate. So when you do this all the time, when you're editing your code in Emacs, you save it, and then you go to your compiler and run your compiler this is a way that we can communicate between processes. But there are many other ways. We can use all kinds of APIs that we'll discuss later in the term. For the rest of the lecture, we're gonna break it up into two parts. First, we're gonna look at the basic abstraction of the process. We're gonna see how to create kill and communicate between processes. And we'll try to put this together into the basics of how your shell or command prompt works in your operating system. In the second half, we're gonna focus on how does the kernel implement the process abstraction. And we'll only go into a little bit of detail this time, just to help build up our abstractions as we keep going. In a couple weeks, we'll come back to this to discuss in further detail how exactly all of the details come together to implement the process. So let's start by looking at how we create processes. In the traditional Unix view of the world, there's only one function we use to create processes called fork. Fork is going to create a new process that's an exact copy of the current process. So we can take a program called fork and we'll have two instances, two processes that are now running with the exact state that they had when they called fork. In the parent process, we're gonna return the process ID. It's just an identifier, a number, that refers to what the ID of the child is. In the child process, we get to return zero. The use of this ID is that we can use this to wait for the child process to exit. So a common pattern might be to call fork many times to use different processors to do some computation. And when we're done, each of those processes will exit and the parent will be using wait or wait PID to be able to wait on all the different children exiting and know when all of them have completed the processing tasks that they need to complete. So think about when you run your build and you call make, make is actually forking 
and running all the different instances of your compiler, often in parallel, and it'll be calling wait on each of them, waiting for each process to exit before it can proceed to the next set of steps. So we see here, wait PID allows us to wait for the process. It'll just take that process ID that we received from the fork call, and it'll allow us to receive an error code telling us whether or not the program exited correctly or not. It'll actually get a small number with a value, and it'll have an optional flag that allows us to say if we should wait for a process to exit, or just return an error telling me that I don't have any processes pending. The next basic APIs is how can we kill or delete a process? When a process is behaving normally, the process will call exit. And here you get to see that we get to pass in a status code. This is related to the status code that is received by wait PID. The current process will stop executing and the operating system is gonna clean up all of its state. Another way that we could delete or kill a process is by using a function called kill. Kill will send a signal telling the process to exit. And we're not gonna go into all the detail of the different types of signals, but the two common ones would be sig term for terminating a process, but it allows the application to cleanly terminate an exit. It's a way of notifying the application that you want it to exit or sig kill that's a stronger version of this that says to kill the process immediately and it doesn't allow the application to clean up state. And how do we run a different process? So, so far I've only told you how we can create instances of the same process by copying a process and creating a new copy of it. I haven't told you how we run a different program. So when you're in your command prompt or your shell, and you type in Firefox, how does your shell actually do it? Well, initially, it will call fork to create a new instance of the shell, and immediately after, it's gonna call one of these variations of exec. And exec is just gonna load the new program that you want on top of the current running process. Usually, this will be done through one of the many wrappers of exec, all of them basically allowing you to pass in the program that you wanna run and the set of arguments that you want the program to receive. So when I call GCC with file A, what it's doing is it's going to fork, then GCC is gonna be exec, overloading the shell and replacing the shell in memory with the memory of this process. We'll get to go into more detail of how this works in a few lectures, but for now, just assume that exec means we're going to replace the running process. So we'll see here a really simple example of how this comes together in our mini shell. Here you can see the miniature shell that I mentioned. The shell example will help us understand more clearly what each of these functions does in practice and how you can use them. So we can see here, starting on line nine, we have our main loop. The main loop just parses a line of input from the user. Every time the user presses enter, it parses that line, returns those arguments to the loop, and then the loop will fork and try to ex execute the program specified by the command line. So as soon as the user presses the input and presses enter, the input line will get parsed and we call fork. Remember that fork clones the process. It creates a new copy, what, what we'll call a child process, that's identical to the parent. It will have the same global variables, the same local variables, the same code as the parent. But from that point on, these two programs will execute separately. So as soon as fork completes, and returns back into both processes, we'll see that we'll receive two different return values. On the parent process, 
we're going to receive the PID of the child. In this case, the PID is 6. On the child process, we're going to receive a value of 0, specifying that we are the child. Next, the child process is going to execute the do exec function, while the parent is going to call wait pid. Wait pid is another call that we specified that will have the process wait for that particular PID to exit. So the parent is going to go to sleep now and not execute any more code until the child process is completed. The child process, meanwhile, can continue to execute and it's going to call exec VP, one of the variants of exec that's going to run whatever the process was specified by the user as input in argument zero. If successful, this is never going to return. This function will replace the entire environment with the new program. If it's not successful, we'll immediately flow into the next command, which is peer, which is going to print the error code that was returned. This is just a nice utility function for printing error codes in most Unix operating systems. And finally, the child will exit with an error value of one. If successful, the child process gets completely replaced. All of the code and data will be wiped away and the new program that was specified by the user will be executed starting right in the first line of the main function. The parent, meanwhile, which is still the shell that you're interacting with as a user, is waiting for this process to exit. It still has PID 6 and wait PID will sit there waiting for this process to complete. Once complete, wait PID is going to return. And if you specified a value, wait PID will actually return the exit code that is specified by the program. So exit 0 could be returned to wait PID but we've specified the parameter null, which means we're going to discard the error code. We don't care what happens. So you can see here that the basics of how your shell works is very simple. All of the remaining features in your shell are really just combining these things together with other facilities in the Unix operating system and making them easy for you to use as a user. We'll go through one more nice example of a common operation you do in your shell to help you understand more about how the user space works. We haven't had a chance to talk about how files and devices are accessed yet. We will get to that later in the term in more detail. But for today's lecture, let's just recap a little bit of what you might have seen in previous classes. When you open a file in a Unix operating system, that file is represented by a file descriptor. The file descriptor in Unix is simply an integer that represents that device or file. So here we can see we're providing some of the calls that manipulate file descriptors. So we're only going to look at two right now. The first is dupe2. Dupe2 all it does is it copies the descriptor from one integer to the next. So when you pass in 5 comma 2 into dupe 2, what it's doing is it's taking the file descriptor that was open at 5 and it's going to copy it over to file descriptor 2. These are going to be identical files. They'll be the same instance, in fact, inside of the operating system. So all operations will propagate from one to the other. The second call that we have is fcntl, which is the file control. And this allows us to set a few special flags. Don't worry too much about this, but the basic flag that we're going to use today is the close on exec flag. So this means that when I execute a new program, typically most of my file descriptors are closed. I can choose to leave certain file descriptors open so that the new program that is executing in place of the shelled binary is able to access those file descriptors. So the common way that we use these two calls is for redirection of inputs. We can see down here that we have a command 
and we can redirect an input. In this case, the input would be a file that we're redirecting into the command. And we're gonna redirect the output of the command into a file called output and the errors from the command into the error log. So let's see how this comes together. So we can see in this code snippet here that we can replace do exec with this extra logic that if a file is specified in the input, output, or error, what we'll do is we'll open that file, read-only or writable, and then we'll dupe that file descriptor into the correct file descriptor for standard input, standard output, and standard error. Remember that in Unix, file descriptor zero is traditionally the input to your program, file descriptor one is the output, and file descriptor two is the error. When you run a program normally, these file descriptors will point to the console and you'll see that is your input and output that you can interact with. In this example, the shell, all it has to do is if any of these files are redirected, it'll open the file, dupe it into the correct descriptor number, ensure that that descriptor isn't gonna be closed, and then execute the program. And the program's gonna inherit these three file descriptors from the shell. The remaining file descriptors will have been closed. We're gonna look at one last primitive that is commonly used in a shell, and that's pipes. Pipes are a basic form of IPC, or inner process communication. They allow you to wire up multiple processes to communicate. The way that you do this is by using the pipe system call. And this creates a file descriptor, two file descriptors, the first that you can read from and the second that you can write to. This creates a unidirectional channel for us to communicate from file descriptor in zero and file to file descriptor one. The basic file operations like read, write, and close all work with the, these file descriptors. And when we close one side, we're gonna be able to detect that the other side has closed. Or we'll actually send a signal to the process. So a simple example of how you use this in a shell is that you type command one, pipe command two, pipe command three, and so on. And what this is doing is this is communicating from command one, all of the output of command one will be fed into command two. And we're gonna do this again by creating a pipe and using dupe two to copy the file descriptors into the correct standard inputs and standard outputs of each of these processes. So here, let's look at one more code example where we can see how we pipe between different programs in our shell. So we've again modified do exec. And the main goal here is to just set up all of the different pipes between the input from one program and the output of a different program. So we're gonna have a simple while loop, and this is somewhat pseudocode, I've simplified it a bit, that we're gonna iterate through the different commands that we're supposed to pipe together. We're gonna to create a pipe and immediately fork. Remember this is do exec, so the shell has already forked once, we're actually forking a second time once for all the commands that we need to pipe into, except for the first command. The parent process runs the default case where it's going to take the input and set it up as the standard input for the next command to run. And it's gonna continue executing this loop. The child process on the other hand is set up to take its standard output and feed it into the pipe. We close the other pipe descriptors and then we run those programs. And we can keep doing this as many times as possible, wiring up the standard output of the first program into the standard input of the second and so on in a chain, allowing our, all of our processes to communicate together. We're gonna to get to see a little more about how all of this works and file descriptors in more detail later in the term, but I think this is helpful to start to understand a little bit about how your shell works and how these different pieces come together.
You might ask yourself, why do we use fork? If you think back to all the examples I showed you today, we fork and then we exec, replacing the original binary. So we're doing duplicate work. We're taking one process, creating a copy, so we have two, and then we're overriding one of those processes with the new binary that we really wanna run. So it turns out that we already have a call called spawn that allows us to do this. This usually isn't implemented as a system call, although it can be. It's often a library call that just calls fork and exec. And the reason is that sometimes it's actually useful to just fork. Some web servers, they fork multiple instances, multiple processes, and each of them is serving clients independently. We also see this with many other tools that need to fork multiple instances for some kind of concurrency to have better throughput and performance. But the real win is really comes down to the Unix philosophy. And it's that the Unix philosophy is that we combine a lot of simple APIs together to have more powerful tools at our disposal. So you can see that all of the commands I described today are relatively simple. They have very few arguments. They don't do a lot of things. They do one task really well and we combine them together to achieve all the different things you can do with a shell. This is the philosophy behind virtually all Unix primitives. So we can see the alternative here. If we look quick briefly at the Windows API, Windows actually has a single create process, which is really a type of spawn, it has a few different variations that are even worse, but the basic create process passes in tons of arguments to be able to support all the different things you could do, whether you inherit file descriptors, inherit handles, they call them handles in Windows, all the different flags, the environment, what directory you're running in, all these security attributes, process and thread attributes, all of this has to be specified in a single complicated command that does everything at once. And as times have changed, and as if they've needed new primitives, they've had to create new versions of create process that are specialized for different tasks in the system. This is the elegance of the Unix philosophy, is that all of this is achieved simply by combining simpler system calls together. So now we're gonna briefly look at the kernel view of processes. We're gonna come back to this a little later in the term, but I wanna start setting us up to understand a little bit better how threads are implemented and what's going on with threads. So let's look a little bit about how processes are implemented in the kernel. As I said, we will come back to this, but this is gonna help us understand the different abstractions that we're gonna talk about in the next few weeks. The basic idea is that for any process, we have a structure, usually called struct proc or struct thread, in, as in OS161, that we typically refer to this as the process control block. This contains all the information and state associated with the process. This tells you what state the process is in. Is it runnable? Is it running currently? Or is it waiting on user input? Is it blocked in some way? It tells you the process ID, who owns the process, the user ID, all this other information that we'll talk about later. And then all of the registers and what code is currently running there. The address space, what is in memory? What are the files that are mapped? What are the programs that are loaded? The libraries that are loaded? All of that is described in the address space. And a bunch of other information like what files are open, all kinds of security and accounting and other things that we'll see later on. The operating system at any given time will have the program executing in one of several states. The process will either be in a new or terminated state where it's starting or ending its life, it's in a running state where it's executing currently 
or it's in a ready state where it could be run at any point. And finally, it's in some kind of waiting or block state when it's waiting for IO or for something else to complete. So when you call wait PID, for example, you're in the waiting state. You're waiting for another process, the child process to exit. The kernel, simply what it's gonna do is it has a list of all of the tasks that it can run and it's gonna run any process that's in the ready state. So it'll scan over all of the programs that are currently runnable, right, or in the ready state, and then run them. So to us, it seems like a lot of programs are running in our system at the same time. What's happening is the operating system is really just switching between all of these different programs very rapidly. The only parallelism it gets is when hardware has multiple cores or CPUs so that it can run these things in parallel. We'll see later in the term a little bit about how this scheduling, as it's called, works and how the operating system selects what it's going to run next. But for now, just assume that these things are run in some order. The second thing that we should understand is this basic idea of preemption. That a process can be preempted by the kernel. Typically, in most operating systems, they are preemptible operating systems. When your program is running, it might be compute bound. It might be running a computation. The operating system will forcefully take the CPU away from the program with the help of hardware and then start allowing other programs to run for a period of time. There are multiple ways this can happen. One is the program might make a system call. It does a function call into the kernel and the kernel decides that it should put the process to sleep and allow another process to run. The second is a periodic timer interrupt where we use the hardware to poke at the kernel periodically and tell the kernel, hey, you should run something else now. And when we get further along and start talking about scheduling and devices, we'll get to see how that exactly works. The third is usually through general device interrupts. Any device IO happens, maybe you press keystrokes on the keyboard and one of the programs was waiting on your keyboard keystrokes. We might pause the current program and allow that program to run. Some OSs do this actively to make them very responsive to the user input. The way that we do this is through this basic idea that we'll come back to again later in term of called the context switch where we take a program, we save the current program that's running, and we're gonna to switch to the new program that we want to run. So let's look briefly at how a context switch works. The context switch works by whatever causes the operating system to gain control, whether it's a system call or interrupt, the operating system decides that it's going to switch to a new process and it's going to save the PCB. It's going to save all of the state of the running program, all of the CPU registers, all of the hardware state that the application has direct access to. It's going to save that into the PCB and it's going to load the PCB of the target process it wants to run. And then we're going to switch to the new process. The context switch path is very machine dependent. We're saving all of the CPU registers, the floating point state, condition registers, flag registers. Also all the address translations have to be saved and restores that we'll talk about later in the term. And it's also important to know that it's not a negligible cost. It is actually pretty costly. We're saving a lot of CPU state, which takes some number of cycles to do. And we're also having to remap all of the memory mappings. Remember that we've used the hardware to give each application its own view of memory. And this is done through the translation look aside buffer, the TLB that implements this and saving and restoring all that state tends to actually be the dominant cost. So in subsequent lectures, we're gonna to get to go into see these things in more detail but for the next few weeks, we're going to focus on talking about threads, which are a simpler abstraction built into processes, and then look at concurrency and how we can make our programs fast and scale.
to many cores and CPUs. 